Uh, joining me now is my pack, political journalist Ava Santina and the author, podcast host and comedian Constantine Kissim. Well, welcome uh, to both of you. So, Constantine, great to have you finally on the program because I can finally hold you to account for something that you tweeted to me. Um, I was just curious, really, what, what you were thinking when you did this because I tweeted this after a few days of the, of the war. The appalling images and accounts of what innocent Israelis suffered on October the 7th are utterly heartbreaking. And so are the appalling images and accounts of what innocent Palestinians have <laughs> suffered since then. If you disagree with any part of this, you have no humanity or moral compass. And you replied, the appalling images and accounts of the Holocaust are utterly heartbreaking. And so are the appalling images and accounts of what innocent Germans in Dresden suffered. If you disagree with any of this, you've lost your humanity. And I've got to say, in the moment, I was a bit annoyed by it. And then I thought longer about what you were saying. And I thought you made a very good point. <clears throat> and it's a point that many people, I have to say mainly on the uh, Israel Defence Force side, have made quite forcefully since, which is that if this war uh, was being waged on social media, if the World War II was being waged the same way with social media the way it is, then would the actions of the Allies against German civilians be judged differently? And I think they probably would. I think you're right. Uh, well, yes, I think I am right, Piers. Uh, but also, the other thing I would say is I share the moral quandary that you were talking about with Neil Ferguson earlier. Nobody can look at the pictures of what we're seeing from Gaza and be in any way happy about what is happening. But I think, if we're being honest, let's look at what uh, the Allies, Britain and the Americans did during the last year of World War II. We dropped more than a Hiroshima a, a day on Germany for a year non-stop in order to win that war. And I think if you look at it from Israel's point of view, uh, imagine what, what the equivalent of that would be here in the UK. It would be equivalent of, say, the IRA during the Troubles, uh, invading northern England, killing over 8,000 people, taking 1,000 people hostage. And uh, What do you think Margaret Thatcher would have done? I think we have to be clear about the moral, the inability to make a moral comparison between these two while having every bit of compassion for innocent civilians who are caught up in this. Um, Ava, my whole issue here is, and whenever I talk to anyone from the Israeli government and I ask them a straightforward question, how many Hamas terrorists are you actually killing? It's pretty clear from their answers they don't know. Uh, I mean, they kind of they try and faint it a bit and try and make out they know, but they don't actually know. And what we do know from the admittedly Hamas-run health authority, but their numbers are not being contradicted by independent bodies, is that the number of civilians dying is massive. And if you can't provide evidence of how many Hamas terrorists are getting killed, then the, the moral position that Israel finds itself in, in terms of public opinion around the world, starts to erode quite fast, I think. Well, the problem that you have there is that Israel and the IDF won't allow journalists to go into the Gaza Strip, and that's also being, you know, aided by Egypt, who also won't allow journalists to cross the Rafah crossing. So it's very difficult to independently verify what is going on on the Gaza Strip. But, you know, also back to what you were just talking about there with Constantine, you know, I would say in terms of the scale, it's very similar to what happened in Dresden, but you would never have that now because we've got the Geneva Convention in place and you've also got the European Court of Human Rights. And those two pieces of legislation should tell us that the killing that is going on in Gaza is absolutely atrocious and is, you know, in violation of international law. Constance, I want to talk to you about Prince Harry. It's not a subject I ever willingly bring up uh, from a sense of personal joy about wanting to discuss him. Uh, however, he keeps putting himself back in the news and he's in court again in London today demanding to have royal protection whenever he and his family are in the UK, despite quitting the country, quitting royal duty and spending the last few years trashing the family and the monarchy. Should he be entitled to have royal protection? Well, actually, uh, even in the court case that is now happening, one of the things that is clear is that he was being offered protection as any high-profile public figure would be in the UK. It was simply not at the level that a working royal would be offered. Uh, and, uh, Piers, I, I, you say you, you don't bring this up willingly. I don't really pay much attention to these people, but I do remember distinctly some time ago them quitting public life and moving on. And since then, all mm. we have seen is them complaining about one thing after another. First, there was the fake racism about the baby. Now it's this, and it just never seems to stop. And it seems to me that they quite enjoy their attention. I know that's a cynical interpretation, but it just seems to me that they can't live without the attention and they're courting it deliberately. 
Yeah, and Ava, you know, I talked with uh, Neil Ferguson about this secondary issue of the way that they tainted with that Oprah interview the entire country via the prism of our figureheads, the royal family and the monarchy, as a bunch of callous racists, when in fact, you know, this is from a historian like Neil, who knows better than most uh, what a racist, intolerant place looks like. And he, you know, by any normal metric, Britain is one of the most tolerant places in the world. I think that you, I mean, I think you know what you're saying there. You know, you've made a decision that the royal family haven't done anything racist and there's not going to be any further scrutiny of whether, you know, anyone in the royal family said something to upset Meghan. But look, you know, we were all there for the last couple of years and the couple of years leading up to their, well, sorry, not a couple of years, but a couple of months leading up to their wedding. We do know how the pr press treated Meghan Markle and we do know that there were a lot of allegations made against her that, I'm sorry, they could be called racist. You know, she, she had a pretty like terrible time. Like what? Look, I, I'm not going to go over like old what? accusations. I mean, there was... Well, name, well, name one. All right, name OK, one. so her skin colour was, you know, she was called exotic. That was a pretty racist thing to say. And, you know... Yeah, that was... Ra Rachel, jo Rachel and, Johnson you know, and used also that Rachel phrase. Johnson, the reason I, I don't like bringing that up is because upset. Rachel has, yes, has, you know, corrected that in, you know, the years that followed that. But, you know, there were many... Mm. There were accusations levelled at her that were completely unfair. I mean, there was a two-page spread given to her consumption but they weren't, of avocados. they weren't racist. Were totally, it was totally ridiculous. Yeah, but they weren't racist. And my point is, if, if you go back and look at the press coverage on the wedding day, for example, I know I wrote the man on Sunday's big piece on it. Um, everyone was welcoming in this country the idea of a biracial marriage into the royal family. Not there everyone. There was a tinge Not of everyone. racism. Not yes, everyone. Yes, actually. No, Pretty not much everybody. That's like, like saying no that racism. all fans of the Premier League aren't racist. And we do know that people who comment on it, you know, all the footballers' Instagrams after every single match do put racist comments on there. But you can mm. make an argument that the Premier League itself is not racist. Look, I think there was a level of introspection that was levelled at Meghan Markle that was totally unfair, totally uncalled for. And no wonder she basically had a breakdown and had to leave the country. Yeah, I don't think it was that at all. I think she was a very cynical person who decided to hook her claws into Prince Harry as a meal ticket for life, dragged him back to California for the good life in a mansion where they trade off their royal titles for hundreds of millions of dollars. And I think it's despicable. However, we can agree to disagree. Maybe on this one we might find some agreement. Uh, Constantine, this uh, once again, this issue of trans athletes competing in women's sport has reared a very ugly head in terms of what happened in Illinois in a cycling competition, a women's cycling race, where the gold and silver medals were won by two biological males identifying as trans women. Now, this is the latest in a long series of these farcical results in women's sport, which are clearly eroding the fairness and equality and integrity of women's sport. And my question is simply, why are we still allowing this to happen? Why, why A, are official sports bodies not just banning it completely when there's such an obvious disadvantage to women born with female biological bodies? But secondly, um, why aren't more women standing up? Is it because the ones who do get, get crucified at the altar of trans activism? Well, I hear Ava touching next to me, so I'm fearful of what I'm about to say. But look, first of all, on the trans women in, in, in women's sports thing, I, we're all looking for the next... Ho I don't know what to say. I mean, it is so obvious. We have had Richard Dawkins on trigonometry, Sharon Davis, the former British Olympic swimmer, detailing bit by bit by bit every way in which men have a physical advantage over women when it comes to physical competition. And by the way, you don't need to be a scientist. You just need to have a brain, look around to know that there is a physical difference between men and women. Uh, as for why more women don't stand up, look, first of all, I think we should acknowledge there are many, many very courageous women who have uh, spoken out about this. Mm. And I just mentioned Sharon Davis, but I could give you a list as long as my arm. But I do actually agree Riley with Gaines, you. I'm not... J.K. Rowling. Yes, of course. I generally don't uh, buy into the sort of allegations that men and women are treated differently in lots of different fields. But I do think, actually, on this issue, uh, it is true. Women, I think, are perceived as being slightly more vulnerable. And the very hateful, bigoted trans activists that go after people, especially online, uh, they do seem to target the women more. So I think it's actually on the men in, and the women in this case, but particularly on the men to stand up and lead in saying this is completely ridiculous and it needs to end. OK, Ava, my question for you, when was the last time a trans man competed against biological men and beat them? 
I just don't think that we would have that level of introspection. It's probably that journalists aren't trying to hunt out that story because they don't think it's going to make headline news. Look, no, you know, no. At the moment... No, 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 Ava, Ava. It hasn't happened. That's why no one's written about okay, it. Okay, look, at the moment... No one writes about currently, okay. trans men winning against men because they don't beat them. Piers, at the moment, we are currently, you know, we're currently witnessing the trial of Brianna Gay, who was, you know, a young trans girl who, you know, sadly lost her life. And, you know, we'll, we'll have to see what comes out mm. of the court. I can't say too much more on it. But also, you know, a colleague of mine just returned from a, tra a young trans boy who'd taken his own life. The way that we are treating trans people in this country is disgusting. There are such a small proportion yeah, of them... But and I don't okay. understand hang on, this, this hang why on. we won't leave them alone. Ava. Yeah, but one of the reasons why trans people are getting a hard time is because of this ridiculous defence of the indefensible over the issue of trans athletes in women's sport. It makes an absolute mockery of all trans people. I know trans people who wish this would all just go away, that trans people would stop trying to fight at this ridiculous altar of unfairness are and they? battle for their own are fairness they? and equality. Because I think yes, what they are. are. No, yes, I they think are. what they're fighting for is just to be recognised and just to be left alone. You know, I, it doesn't need to be this headline, media, speculation, insanity all the time. If perhaps the media showed some care for them every other day of the year, then maybe we could have a sensible conversation about sport. Maybe I could, you know, start talking to you normally about perhaps what is going on, you know, with the cycling. But frankly, I don't really care when I know that trans people are taking their own lives every single day. What about the women who are competing okay. in these sports and who are not getting an opportunity we've, to compete fairly? We've Surely run out of time, guys. Constantine, I've loved having you back. Please come back again soon. Ava, always good to have you. We'll agree to disagree.